It's good to be able to stand before you tonight. I want to tell you that this has been one of the most challenging things for me to do because for the last week or so, I've been trying to decide what it was that I wanted to speak about. And when I look at the news and when I look at the TV and I look at the paper and I look at all the things going around us and I see all of the immorality that's going on in this world and all of the things that Satan has presented to people as good and honest, maybe I should bring a lesson on that. I also look at the church and I see where in our country and in our society discipline is something that is not very prevalent. Most things have lost the discipline that they once had. And so I thought, maybe bring a lesson on that. And so as Corky asked me this morning what the memory verse was going to be, I told him I would have to decide this afternoon. And so I did, and I hope what I've chosen tonight would benefit us all. Many of you have jobs and you work. Many of you get the opportunity to have so much vacation time a year. And it's this time of the year when... So many people are gone, and people are gone on vacation, and they do different things in their life than what is the normal way of their life. And so we think about the Christian life and how we should live that life day in and day out. I'm also mindful of those that do not work, that have retired. And it seems as though I'm getting faster and faster approaching that time in my life. And so I have these thoughts and these plans about all of the things that I want to do. And so I wonder if the thoughts and the plans that people have when they retire bring into account the more time that they have to serve God. Or does it just take into account the time that they have to do the things that they desire to do for themselves? And so I started thinking about this idea that Satan is before us. As 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 says, Our adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. And so I've heard all of my life, and I believe it to be so, because the Bible explains it that way, that we have a challenge before us. That we are in a battle against Satan. And Satan is trying to win the souls of each and every person on the face of this earth. And so when we think about that, we think about this idea of us being in an army. I've never been in the military. But we do have some young men in this congregation. We have one that's back here that's just come in for today. And one that just left. And we've had people throughout the the history of this congregation that have served in the military. Many of you have. And you have got out of the military. So you understand some of the things that go on within the ranks of the military units. And the things that they are involved in. And the things that they have to do. And in our country, we have the greatest military in the world. But there are things that must be done within that military and the different groups and the different units and divisions And all of those things. There's different MOSs that people have. There are different things that they are involved in. And so we understand that. Even if we haven't been in the military. And one of the things that we know that our country is in a war. And it has been for a long time. Fighting evil because of the way that there's people that want to destroy our way of life. Our freedoms that we enjoy. And there's men and women on the front lines that are protecting us at this very hour against those things, whether it be in the field, going place to place searching, or whether it be in an office or a room somewhere looking at the cyber things that's going on that I can't even understand. But they're there, and they protect us. And they have many different tasks that they have to perform. And friends, I know, even not being in the military, that they have rules and they have engagement rules and regulations that they must adhere to. And even within those rules and regulations, they have to follow through with them. Because if they don't, people die. Things are destroyed. 
And so every person has a job to, es- to execute. But even in that realm of work, people get tired. People spend long hours. They do many things, and so they get tired. And so they have to go on, I believe in the military, it's called furlough. Or it used to be. I don't know if it still is. I guess I should have checked. But a furlough is just simply uh, a leave of absence from duty that's granted, especially it's speaking about personnel in the military service or in the armed services. And so they go and they rest, just like we go on vacation. I go on vacation a couple or three times a year. Many of you do. And you get away and you do things that's not in the normal of your life. But we must always be aware we're still in a battle, whether we're here or whether we're, all, we're off and gone somewhere else. And I'm afraid many times people leave their normal life and they go out and they live a life that's not normal for them. And in doing so, they don't even do the normal things that they normally do, which would think about in pleasing God. And so when the people in the military go on these furloughs to recuperate and to rest, the job still goes on. Somebody has to take care of that job. It must be done. And so even in times of vacation when you leave, how many people think about their service to God in doing that? And so I want it to be known tonight, and I've said this before and I'll say it again if the Lord wills that I have the opportunity, we are in a battle We are waging a warfare. And as Christians, we should listen to and adhere to the things that God has given us in His Word to help us to be stronger in that war and in that battle. Because that adversary, he's out there and he wants to destroy you. And he will use anything and he will use anybody. Make no mistake about it. He will use the closest people that you know to you. And he will do, he will not mess around by thinking that he doesn't have to spend much energy on you because he tries. Continually, he tries. And so when we bring that back down to our Christian life, those of us that have put on Christ, those of us that have chosen to walk that life and live that life in obedience to Christ, we're engaged in that war against Satan. And we need to remember that. And as soldiers, we're in the army of God. And I'm not using that just because it's a thought of mine. I'm not using that or saying that because I come up with this certain uh, way of presenting this lesson. Let's listen to what God says as the apostles write by inspiration of the Holy Spirit and the words that Jesus say. And we're going to use multiple passages tonight. If you have a pen and paper, I would really encourage you to write these down because I want you to look at these things and apply them to your life, much as I've had to do over the last week, and much as we all should do from time to time. And so as soldiers in God's army, Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3, Thou therefore endure good hardness. Listen to this. As what? as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So he's bringing that thought process of being in this army together to that young preacher Timothy as he goes about and as he is inspired by the Holy Spirit to say these things. And so as these soldiers of Jesus Christ, as we march forward in this life, we are to be ready. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18, Paul there tells Timothy, I char- this I charge, this charge, excuse me, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went on before thee, that thou might war a good warfare. Again, the very thought and the very idea that we are in a war. Paul charged Timothy to war a good warfare warfare, to fight the good fight of faith, to lay hold on eternal life, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 12. 
And so as he was encouraging that young preacher, Timothy, and as he was giving him instructions, he tells him that there's a war, there's a battle going on, and to continue in that, and to fight that good fight, to lay hold on that, and to not leave that, and to lay hold on eternal life, and that we must be consistent in all that we do. We must live according to the Word. Paul again writes to Timothy in the second letter, in chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall what? Be able to teach others also. That therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself in the affairs of this life, that he may please him that hath chosen him to be a soldier. And this army, the army of God, the one that's out there fighting against Satan, the one that's out there is trying to gain souls for the Master, the Lord of the universe, the God of the universe, the one that created all things, and not the prince of this world. Soldiers of God are not to be ashamed. Too many times people are ashamed of the Word of God. The Apostle Paul wasn't ashamed. Jesus wasn't ashamed. None of the apostles were ashamed. All of those faithful men and women that we read about in the Bible were not ashamed. Paul said in Romans, in 1 and verse 16, the passage that we all know, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul wasn't ashamed of the word. Are you ashamed of the word? Are you ashamed to tell someone that they're living wrong? Are you ashamed to look in the mirror and look in God's Word and make that as a, as a glass be holding back to us and apply that lifestyle to your life? Are you ashamed to admit that you're wrong? Are you ashamed to admit that you're living not in accordance to God's will? And will you repent of that? That's the question that's always asked, and we always are going to have to give that answer, and each person's going to have to give that answer for himself or herself. And you can be deceived because you can deceive yourself, but that answer should be made honestly and sincerely. And if you're in this battle, rest assured that you need to be ready because you're going to suffer afflictions. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 8. Be thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of be thou not ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Friends and brethren, people are not going to like you sometimes because of your stance. In God's army. You know the the slogan, I think, it's not just a job, it's an adventure in our military and the advertisements that we see on TV. But it's not just a job. This army of God is not just a job. It's a way of life. It's the way you live your life each and every day. And we're told by the Apostle Paul, as he wrote to those in Rome, in chapter 12, in verse number 1 and 2, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, and be not conformed to this world, and be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove that which is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we are to transform our lives. We are to live in accordance to His will. And so we're not to live according to the world. We're to live according to the words of God. And what is these people that's in this army. Who are they? They're the church. They're the people of God that were first called Christians in Antioch. They are Christians. They are those that are striving to live faithfully to Him. And we are to suffer as a Christian, as it says in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 16. And again, they were called Christians first at Antioch, I believe Acts chapter 11 and verse number 26, if I remember correctly. And so think about these things. This is a war. It's going on. And we are to be obedient. But how are we to be obedient? Those that 
or in any kind of a structured organization of any kind, and I'm not calling the church an organization, I'm calling it the church, but in any kind of organization there are rules and regulations, and so Christians have those same responsibilities to adhere to. Not just part of them, not just those that we like, not just those that fit our mold or our mindset, all of them. You can't just focus on one thing and say, I'm a faithful Christian. There's all kinds of things that we are to be putting on our lives and thinking off, taking off in our lives. Peter refers to those people that are Christians as obedient children in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 14, as obedient ch- children, not fashioning yourselves, listen to this again, after the former lust in your ignorance as obedient children, not going back to what you were before you were a child of God, but moving forward. The Apostle John tells us in Revelation chapter 22 and verse number 14, Blessed are they that do His commandments, for they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter, listen to this, through the gates. Where are they going, John? Where are we going to go? Through the gates into the city. That reward that eternal home. And so we are to do His commandments. We are to live faithfully to Him that we can have a right to the tree of life. Not because we've earned it, not because we deserve it, but because God through His grace has allowed us the opportunity through obedience to His Word that He established in the church throughout all of ages from, the, from forever God has, no, has known that he was going to have this church established and that he was going to send his son and his son was willingly going to come to this earth and that he was going to shed his blood and be that perfect sacrifice for us and that through obedience to that will and through that kingdom that he established that we have the ability to be called Christians and be obedient children unto Him. Paul makes this declaration when he talks about the children of light in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 8, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye are light in the Lord. And then he tells them this statement. This is a bold statement, but this is a statement that Paul, by inspiration, says he tells them, Walk as children of light. Walk in the light. Walk as those children ought to walk. And because of it, that it is a way of life and it's not just a job, we cannot take time off. Yes, you may go on vacation, but you can't take off time off from being a Christian. You need to continue to live. You can't go on vacation. You can't go on furlough. You have to stay always focused in the walk that you're walking. Always do things that are right and pleasing in accordance to God's Word and not exhibit things because you have a couple of weeks off. And it has amazed me, and I get, again, I'm getting to that age, but it has amazed me how people, when they retire, have more time on their hands but less time to do God's Word or to study His Word or to go out and to be a part and be one of those persons that teach others and show others and let their light shine to the world. They have less time to do that and more time for themselves. But this is a walk of life that goes on throughout all of your life. There's a studying that needs to be done. There's an understanding of God's Word. And H.D. appropriately said uh, last week, I believe it was, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, where it says, Study or give diligence. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We need to give diligence to that. Live according to it. Study it and apply those things to our lives. Each and every one of us. And let me tell you something. My toes are probably hurting worse than anybody else's toes are. But this is what we need to do. And this is the preparation that we need to make. We're told to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. Because you see, as children of His, we should be desiring the sincere milk of the Word 
1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2. And now that we're through with the introduction, we'll get on with the lesson. Because I want to make some points tonight, just two points really, I want to talk about. I want to look at the character of the person that is walking this life. What is the character of that person? How should that person live? And then secondly, we want to see the pattern of this walk. Because you see, there's a pattern for us that's been given to us. And we need to know what that pattern is. And so in this walk, you'll find that you don't have time to lose. You'll find that each and every moment is precious. You'll find that each and every day is a day that God has blessed you with and do something for Him on that day. So what about the character? What about the character of the people that are in the army of God? What about the character that they should possess? In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13, we're told to gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. And I've brought this uh, before, but gird means to encircle or to gather up, to prepare, to brace as a gird oneself for a contest. It denotes that there must be preparation made. And so in the Asian culture, they wore these long flowing robes. And that was a custom. And so when they were going to be involved in something, they would have to gather that up so it didn't hinder them in their work. Much like it says in Exodus chapter 12, I believe verse number 11, when it's talking about the getting ready for the Passover. And so a soldier in God's army must gather all of their thoughts and keep them in check. And they must gather up their feelings and keep them in check. And we must not only do that, but we must gather up the activities that we do and make sure that they're wholesome and right and good and honest when we think about being in obedience to God's Word. What about these feelings and what about these thoughts? Again, our adversary out there is always trying to put things into our mind that would cause us to doubt or to cause us to surmise. As humans, aren't we wanting always to surmise why something happened or why something went the way that it did? And we're always getting our feelings hurt because things don't go our way. And so we need to keep all of these things in check and we need to take in totality all of the scriptures. But anything that's going to hinder us from getting to heaven, we need to keep that in check. Easier said than done, granted. But as servants of His, and as soldiers in His army, we have to do that. And so we need to be encouraged by each other, and we need to be encouraged by the world, by the Word, and not encouraged by the world. You see, many times we think about things and we let things bother us. Worry is a word that I try not to use in my life. I try not to worry about things, but I am concerned about things. And someone would ask, well, what's the difference? Well, I think there is a difference to some degree. But you're concerned about things. Many, many sleepless nights, not just me, but many people have had because of lost souls. Because people are not wanting to adhere to the Word of God. And it bothers you. And we're concerned about that. And we want them to be saved. The Apostle Paul says he was perplexed. He was distressed. Because he always thought about the church. And he always wanted the people to be saved. And he cared about his fellow Christians. And so we ought to too. But not to the point that it worries us. Because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6. In verse number 20, 27. Which of you taking thought. Listen to this. Can add one cubic. To his stature. In other words, Jesus said, worrying about things and thinking about things, it's not going to change anything. We need to pray for things, and through the providential care of God, those things will be taken care of. Human nature says that sometimes we are jealous about things. 
Sometimes we look at others and wish we had what they had in a way that's not appropriate. Sometimes we get jealous because other people have a talent that we don't have. And so all of these things, I believe, are human traits because the Bible talks about all of them. But listen to what the Apostle John said in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 15. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. That's a strong word. That's a strong accusation. And ye know that no murderer shall inherit or enter into eternal life. And they have eternal life abiding in him is not there. And so we need to understand that even the thought where we have animosity toward a brother can cause us to have that hatred that he's speaking about. And we can be lost for that. And because of that, so we have to keep those thoughts and those feelings in check as we go about. And what about the forgiving others of the trespasses that they have against us? And I'm talking about in context of the Scriptures. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 35, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, Jesus says. If ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. We desire God to forgive us of the things that we do wrong. And we have a certainty that He will if we repent of these things. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we walk in the light, He's faithful and just to forgive us those things when we repent of them. But we have to forgive others also. We can't harbor up that animosity one toward another. It's simply not in the character of a good soldier in the army of God. A good soldier will bring all of their thoughts and all of their feelings into captivity to Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 15, the Apostle Paul writes to those in Corinth, and he says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bring, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. It's a big challenge, but we have to be up to that challenge. And then we go further in those passages that was read before us. He says to be sober in the middle of that verse, verse 13. And I've broken this down before, but I want to make sure that we understand that sober means to be temperance. That means temperance. It means self-control. It means a calmness of mind. It means being serious about things. It means sound thinking doesn't mean running off and thinking things on the spur of the moment and not being able to control our thoughts and our reasoning ability. Why do you think God put by inspiration in there this word, be sober? You know, he says that in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Soberness is not something that's just used right here. Soberness is used all throughout God's Word to bring about those characteristics of the people that should be serving God or that are serving God. The Bible refers to it. I want to give you several examples of it. So look these up. When you think about the qualifications for elders, bishops, shepherds, those overseers of the local congregation... They are to be sober. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 2. He says, A bishop must then be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good in, uh, behavior, given to hospitality and apt to teach. It also says deacons likewise, they are to be sober also. 1 Timothy 3 verse number 8. Women, the wives of deacons, the wives of elders, even so must their wives be grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. So what does sober mean? Sober means self-control, calmness of mind, seriousness, sound thinking. So think about those things. Soberness is something that people have needed throughout all of God's uh, schemes, His scheme of redemption. Older men must be, must have sound 
doctrine, aged men, be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, and in patience. Titus 2 and verse 2. But then he speaks to all Christians. Here he's been speaking to elders and deacons and wives and older men, but then he speaks to all Christians. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6 through 8. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that are drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. First Thessalonians 5. Verses 6 through 8. And then he talks about, or Peter talks to those Christians in Asia Minor in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7. He says, But to the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober, watch and pray. Have self-control. Have a calmness of mind. Be serious about things. Have good and sound thinking. And then 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 that we've looked at already. Be sober, be vigilant. And so there is a lot of information about our character, about soberness, because that soberness helps us to guard against that which is going to be brought before you. It's going to help you to be, guard, to be guarded against false beliefs, false doctrine the whelms of everything, the wiles of the devil, will be able to be guarded against those. Hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The very last part of that verse in 1 Peter 1 and verse 13. The hope that's made possible by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What a great hope. What a great thought that our Lord and Savior gave His life, shed His blood, God raised him from the dead. He was seen of men on this earth after that. And then he was raised and he's sitting on the very right hand of God and he's overseeing his kingdom at this very hour. And he's wanting his servants, he's wanting his soldiers to be bold and to be brave and to be sober and to be self-controlled and to not kid themselves about the way that they're living. But look deeply into that, into his word and live accordingly. That hope is made possible because of Jesus' resurrection. The hope for what we see not. That which we patiently wait for, Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 8, verse 24 and verse number 25. So what is the object of that hope that we're longing for? It's eternal life. It's much better than this life. And that is going to be received at the coming of Christ, at the second coming, when He comes to receive those unto Himself. Those that have been faithful, they'll hear those words, enter in thy good and faithful servant. That's the soldiers that He's talking about, to put on these characteristics. And for those that do not, they will hear the words, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, for I never knew you. But what about the pattern? What about how is it that we are to fashion ourselves? Peter said that we should not be fashioning ourselves according to the former lust of your ignorance. He said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14, that was read before you tonight. Fashioning means, number one, assuming an outward appearance patterned after a certain thing. In this case, he's talking about the world. In other words, a tendency to be like those about us. See, that's the danger of being in the world. We're attracted to those things. You see, even where you're at, where you're at in your work or in your school or in your recreation or wherever you are when you're among people, you're always with being bombarded by the things of the world. They're wanting you to do things. They're wanting you to go fishing on Saturday with them on a on a boat out there where they're going to be serving all kinds of alcohol and it's a party and if you don't even fish they don't care but they want you to go and when you tell them no they say well, what are you one of those people that don't believe in drinking absolutely that's right and so therefore you get looked at differently and you get treated differently but what does that matter what should that matter to us not a thing because we're doing what God says and so we're not to fashion ourselves according to the world because you see in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 
in verse number 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We ought to put off that old man and put on the new. Ephesians 4, verses 20 through 24. Colossians 3, verse number 9 and verse number 10. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. And listen to this. Have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. So we are to be, we are created in the very image of God. We are to set our affections on the, same, on the things that are not on this earth, but on the things that are above. Again, Paul wrote to the Colossians, If we be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on the things above, not on the things of this earth. So where are your affections set? Are they set on the things above, or are they set on the things of this life? So we are commanded to not do those things. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So be holy in manner of conversation, Peter says in chapter 1, verse number 15 of 1 Peter. To be holy, to be sanctified, to have that sanctification, they all have about the same meaning. And what is, is it to be sanctified? It's to be separated from this life of habitual sin and all worldly defilement. So we are to separate ourselves from the world and the defilement that comes with it. Israel was to be holy unto the Lord. Leviticus chapter 20 verses 20 through 26. And there's a number of reasons why the army of God should be holy because our God is holy. And I... For the sake of time, I don't have time to read all of these passages, but I want to give them to you. A life is a way of holiness, Isaiah says in chapter 35 and verse number 8. We are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, Romans 12 and verse 1. We are to be perfect in holiness, 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 11. We are chosen to be holy and without blame in Him. Ephesians 1, verse 4. Because you see, the Lord wants an army that is holy because He wants His church to be holy. And the army of God is His church. Ephesians 5, verse 27. We're called to holiness. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 7. Without holiness, friends and brethren, I'm here to tell you the Bible explains to us that without holiness, you cannot see God. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 14. The one that called us is holy, 1 Peter 1, verse 15. We are a holy priesthood, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 15. We are a holy nation, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 9. And so it doesn't matter if you're young. What does it say in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 1? Let not man despise your youth. And then the middle age, and what about the elderly? The elderly can do so much. I'm here to tell you, the sweet lady, Miss Doris Thompson, even though her body was old and it became wore out, and she finally succumbed to that wearing out of that physical body, even until her last breath that she took, she was still striving to serve God. Saying, encouraging things to people. Sending out notes that people received even after she had passed away because she did it, or had it done, because she wanted it done at the very last. So you're never too old to do those things. So all of us that have enlisted in this army, it's a great army. And there's a great responsibility for each one of us to walk in that life and in that appointed way. Because you see, Jesus said in John chapter 12 and verse 48, the words that I have spoken, the same shall judge you in the last day. We're going to be judged by those words. We're going to be judged according to the deeds that we've done in this life. Romans 2 and verse 6. And so we must seek with patience that eternal life. Romans 2 verse 7. We are to keep His commandments. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. John 14 verse number 15. And His commandments 
the Apostle John tells us are not grievous. 1 John chapter 5, verse number 3. And so, one of those passages that we always love to hear if we're striving to do right. We are to walk in the old paths. Wherein is the good way? Jeremiah 16 and verse no, uh, Jeremiah 6 and verse number 16. So the soldiers of this army must be more holy. They must separate themselves from the world. Our life is but a vapor. It's short. James 4 and verse 14. It's like the flower of the grass when the flower fades away. 1 Peter 1 verse 24. The word of the Lord endureth forever though. 1 Peter 1 verse 25. Christ said, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. John 16 and verse number 33. And so we can overcome the wicked one. We're just not to love the world. We're not to love, have the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. These are not of the Father. But they are, as John says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 14 through 16, they are things that are of the world. So we must have the character. We must strive to live that way. And we should be in that army fighting each and every day. And being encouraged by our fellow soldiers and inspecting our own lives and making sure that we're living that way. If you're here tonight and you're not a child of God, you're not in that army. And because you're not in that army, you're not doing the things that He wants you to do. And you have no place in His kingdom because you've not been obedient to Him. And the Bible tells us that we must hear. So faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, verse 17. We must believe. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you believe not that I am He, you shall die in your sins. John 3, verse 16, John 8, verse 24. Luke 13, verse 3 and verse 5 says we should repent. Matthew 10 and verse 32 says, If you would confess me before men, him will I also confess before my Father, which is in heaven. Verse 33 says, If you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. Then we have a right, John chapter 1 verse 12, to be buried with him in baptism. Romans 6 verse 3 and 4. To be raised to walk in a newness of life. And then be that soldier and live our life accordingly throughout each and every day of our lives. To be baptized. Mark 16 and verse 16. And then those that are Christians, but yet you've not been living your life in accordance and being a good soldier, you need to repent of this uh, wickedness and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thy heart might be forgiven thee, John tells us. And he's faithful and just to forgive us. So if you're in need of anything tonight, if we can help you, I hope that you will think about these things tonight so that you will be a better soldier in that army and live more faithfully to God. Because this congregation of God's people desire that we go to heaven and we can help each other get there. But we all have to give an account for ourselves of the things that we do in this body. Won't you come as together we stand and sing?